Hey everyone, David Yang here. I'm the CEO of Full Stack Academy, and today I want to share my thoughts on what it means to be a full stack developer. Now, I get this question a lot. Why did you call yourself Full Stack Academy, and what does it mean to be full stack? Now, I really wanted to go back and trace the origin of this term, what does it mean, what are what is the benefits, pros and cons of being a full stack developer? So I've laid out a mind map here and I just walk through it as I lay out my thoughts and kind of how we came to think of the term full stack. So I'm gonna start with what is the origin of the term? So I went back and found what I wanna say is a first documented use of the word full stack. And here it is in all its glory, full stack web developers coined by someone named Randy Schmidt. So he talked about appreciating full stack developers in the and that they were able to do design, markup, styling, behavior, and the programming. And it's really great, the people he chose to talk about, because one of these people, Tom Preston Warner, was just getting known in 2008 as the CEO of GitHub. And so it was already an early sign of someone who could really create and hack and get things done as a programmer. Now, another thing I found really interesting about Randy Schmidt's article is that the thing that he thought most cemented someone as a full stack developer was that they were a programmer and they had good skills in design. At least that's what he identified as his own weakness and where he wanted to grow. So that was the first use of the term by Randy Schmidt in 2008. Now, there's another article here by uh, someone named Carlos Bueno, he wrote for Full Stack, and he talks about understanding the Full Stack as a programmer so that you can really solve problems or think about problems the right way. There is a funny uh, XKCD, and XKCD is a, I would say, a geek comic where they talk about how each field views their the next field up as just applied versions of their field, right? And so f mathematicians think physics is applied math. And chemists think, our physicists think chemistry is applied physics. Chemists think biology is applied chemistry. And biology thinks sociology is applied psychology. And so, in essence, that you're the real science and something above you is just applied, you know, practical version of your theory, right? And so, full stack programming was this idea that, yes, we can be working on one part of our application of Facebook, but are we do we really understand what's going on below, right? And so someone who's working on the Facebook feed would say, well, this is just an applied version of the data work that's happening underneath at, at Facebook. So this is really the growth of the use of full stack term. Here we can see that it wasn't really until 2013 that the term took off, right? And so I don't want to claim credit for it. Full stack didn't create the term, but it was really a rapid growth since the time we started using it. Um, and I think because the industry really kind of grew to the idea of we were looking for these full stack engineers. So yeah, so the 12, 2012 time frame really a rapid growth of the term full stack. Now, I guess if we talk about what is a full stack developer, we have to understand what is a stack to begin with. So here, the term stack really came from this idea of what we call a multi-tier architecture or n-tier architecture. And mostly that's lived out in three-layer architecture. So here we go to this Wikipedia article. What is an n-tier architecture? And most applications, they, people thought of them as three different tiers. And so you had your data tier, right? So this is where the information about your business lives. So imagine your Amazon, right? Your data tier is your products, how much inventory you have, who's ordering what, all your user accounts, all your suppliers. And so that's where all your data lives. Now, there's a logic tier of saying things like, well, if this person orders in New York from a unit in California, we apply this kind of tax or we don't apply this kind of tax. So that's your logic tier. That's what the rules about your business live inside the logic tier. And finally, the presentation tier, right? The presentation tier is the catalog in Amazon or the fact that this toolbar is here. It's, it's the application as you see it inside your browser. Right? And so this three-tier architecture usually has three different groups working on it. Right? Your presentation tier would be your, uh, your front-end people. Your logic tier would be your business people. Kind of, they would call this the back-end. Your data tier would be database people. So now, nowadays, databases have become much more accessible. But there was a time period in the industry when no one, it was very, businesses were very careful about who touched their databases, who could have access to the database, the queries they could run. It's not so much like that now in startups because the data is, uh, because the importance of the data and the speed at which we make modifications to it has, that kind of equation has changed. So this was the, what we call the three-tier architecture, multi-tier architecture. And what the stack meant was just that these layers all stacked upon each other, right? Like it wouldn't make sense to have a logic tier if you didn't have data, and it wouldn't make sense to present it if you didn't have 
logic, right? If you didn't have a business rules to run, there's no reason to show anyone anything. And so if you go back, there's kind of a parallelism to this, this, you know, applied thinking is that each layer depends on the layer below it. And there's always a little bit of a thinking that the layer below was more important per se than layer above it, right? It was just an applied version of, you know, the business rules are just applied version of the transformations are just transformations on data. And the presentation is just a visualization of the logic, right? So this, and you can see here, these are like three different layers. This is what we call the stack or, you know, and this would be your whole company could be there. So they call this the full stack. And so then we came up to like, well, what are these different pieces, right? And so the presentation tier, the business layer, the database is what came to be known as the front end, the back end and the database, right? And the back end really just captures the application logic, different rules and the business rules. So that, that under explains what exactly a stack is, right? And Full stack really meant just the idea that you have now a programmer who can work across all three layers. Because before, again, these layers were kind of stratified. Each layer didn't really want the other layers into their business. Now, let's talk about the skills you require for each stack level. So we look at front end, this is the traditional HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and then now increasingly amount front end frameworks, right? So if you want to be a modern front end developer, you have to know HTML, right? That's really how, how things are presented to people in web browsers, which is the primary growth in web development or in software develop, development jobs today. Uh, CSS is how we style that HTML, and then JavaScript is how we make things dynamic, right? So, for example, back to Amazon, when you click categories and this thing pops up, that's a JavaScript interaction, right? That click and then that thing popping up is a JavaScript interaction. And then in terms of front-end frameworks, really there's been the growth and complexity of front-end applications has required that a lot of these reusable pieces, we don't always rebuild it from scratch, right? So we want to use something like React, like Angular, like Ember to make those patterns capture those patterns and make them easy to repeat for us. Now on the back end, you have the traditional server languages, right? So PHP, Java, PHP, Java, and Ruby and Python are probably the most dominant, I would say, server side languages. Uh, also in, in C Sharp, if you're in the Microsoft technology stack. And then JavaScript in 2009 became a viable server language as well with the creation of Node.js, right? Now, backend is, this is the business rules, this is where this is stuff is running on servers in the cloud that a business, you know, that a business owns, not inside the browser, inside the front end. And this is where all the business rules are captured, right? And so, for example, you don't necessarily want to drop all your business rules or like, let's say you have a very proprietary pricing algorithm, right? That you, you Amazon views that as their proprietary advantage, right? Their advantage in the marketplace, you wouldn't want to send that code down to someone's browser because they could, the person in the browser could open it, reverse engineer it, and then use it as well, right? So you want to run all that code on servers that you control and only show the user the end result of those calculations, right? So that was, uh, that's what's happening in the back end. And of course, the database, um, mostly tools were using things like Postgres, MySQL, these are common databases. And the skills here are, you know, how do we design the schema? How do we make sure the data stays valid inside this? How do we, um, how do we manage a storage so that we get high performance? We can make the right queries, make the right inserts, and then also make it so that we can report on how the business is doing, right? So you can imagine if you're Amazon, every hour you want to see how are our sales doing, how's our shipment doing, how's our inventory and logistics running. And so all that information is coming out of reports from your database. So if that stuff is not stored in the right way, then you know that can be very demanding on a database and even slow down your business. All right, so now let's talk about, you know, what are the pros and cons of being a full stack developer? So I would say, let's start with the challenges, right? So the problem with being a full stack developer, working across all three tiers, as opposed to being an expert in one, is that you're a jack of all trades, right? And usually the uh, the converse of being a jack of all trades is that you're a master of none. So that's one challenge is that someone who's knows a little bit about front end, a little bit about back end, a little bit about databases, is is one criticism of you know trying to look for people who are full stack is are they really good at anything in particular? Two is that in the last 10 years, technology has changed so rapidly in each part of the stack. So everything is changing in front-end development, a lot of new practices are emerging in back-end development, and also the rise of the NoSQL movement on the database side, you really have to almost track three different cultures simultaneously, right? Because technology is changing so quickly. And also, each layer has traditionally had very different 
processes and cultures, right? So when you change the business rules, if you want to change the business rules of how taxation is handled, that's a very different process than I want to change the color of a button, right? You might need different processes for who needs to approve this, what kind of um, what kind of testing this need to go through, and so on one team, the front end team might be able to iterate very quickly, while the back end team is you know, going through all kinds of change management processes. And of course, data is even worse, right? Because like you want to add a new column to your database, that's something that you will want to get sign off from a, a bunch of different teams to make sure that that's not going to change the validity of the, da of the data in the business. Now, the pros of being a full stack developer is that as a single person, you tend to be able to solve problems much more quickly, right? Because you don't have to depend on the layer below you for the answer. So for example, if you're only a front end developer and you say, well, I want to show in my Facebook feed another field about this user. I want to show last time they signed on, right? You don't have that information because all you're pulling down from the server is whatever you have right now, right? And so you'd have to make a, you know, probably file a GitHub ticket to your server side people and say, can you also please send down this information about last time this user signed in so I can put it in my feed. Now that person then has to go through all their change management processes to make sure they get this feed down to you before you can solve your problem. Now a full stack developer might be able to pull down the front end, pull down the back end, even modify the database if they need to make those changes and control that whole process, right? So you can solve problems more quickly. Of course, the other big benefit of full stack developer is that if you want to start your own company, Typically companies, you know, if you start with two or three people, you're not going to have all three layers broken out to different roles, right? So one person will be doing both the back end, the front end, and, and managing the data. So you tend to be much more agile in terms of early company people tend to be full stack people. All right, so that goes over, you know, where did full stack come from? What does a stack mean? The skills and the pros and cons. Now let's, let's talk about like how full stack developers fit into the ecosystem, right? So why are full stack, why did people become interested in hiring full stack developers? So across different variations of, of companies, we'll talk about where full stack developers fit in, right? So large companies like full stack developers because of all the benefits of really they can solve problems much more quickly. Right. And so I would combine large companies and growth hacking teams of if I'm if I'm a company like Facebook and I want to test things very quickly in the field, I don't want to have all these different teams organized in a way that they're all dependent on each other to make any progress in their work. Right. I want small teams organized to move efficiently, solve problems quickly. And so I want the developers to understand all the things that need to be changed for them to test out a new idea, test out a new product iteration. Uh, product teams oftentimes often really benefit from having full stack developers, right? Technical product managers tend to be full stack developers because they need to or tend to benefit from being full stack developers because they need to be able to understand how does this change impact the application as a whole. Right. So if you're a if you're a technical product manager and you want to make a change to something and you don't really understand anything about databases or the back end, you're gonna be you know, at a disadvantage of someone who understands all those things, right? So who's a little bit shallow across a wide variety of fields. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, startups really benefit from full stack developers because they can move much, full stack developers tend to be able to move much more quickly than someone who's only positioned in one, in one part of the stack. Now, talk about, about skills that full stack developers have and how to become a full stack developer. So skills, so full stack developers can be very good at making MVPs. Now MVP is a minimal viable product, right? So kind of a launching a startup. Uh, they tend to understand understand the boundaries better, right? So one thing I find it very interesting right now is we're really as a developer community or as a you know developer ecosystem redefining where data sits, who controls it, and how it goes back and forth, right? So for example, GraphQL, RPC, all these things are, which we're kind of changing how we think about these things. And if you don't understand how the other side thinks, how the other side exists, you're going to have a harder time understanding and navigating those boundary changes. So when I say boundaries, I mean the difference between the, the browser, the front end, and the server, the back end, or between the back end and the database, right? So if you have if you don't understand what databases are and you're working on only in backend, then you're going to have a much harder time understanding, well, where does caching fit? What can I cache? How can I optimize database queries? Am I talking to different, which database am I talking to to get this information that I need? And as I mentioned earlier, full stack developers are just more flexible, right? So questions like where does computation rest uh, or where does computation sit? 
So one thing I find very interesting is something called Conway's Law. And what Conway's Law states is that organizations tend to design their applications the way that they are designed. So if I structure my organization in teams of front-end developers, back-end developers, and databases, and, and database engineers, they'll tend to think of their application in that way, in those three stacks. But one thing that program, uh, companies are doing is they're thinking much more, can we have small teams, small flexible teams that own a whole part of their application, right? So, uh, and exactly to address this problem of how do we have more agility in the, in the organization? Because, you know, we tend to have these different stacks, different levels of abstraction. Each level views a level above them as a you know, as a client who's kind of making requests that they don't want to service, right? Or that it's annoying to service. Whereas a team that owns the whole vertical, right? The whole part of the stack that's their part of their application tends to be able to move much quicker and tend to understand why these things need to happen, right? And so or companies are building out these teams in this way that are uh, much more full stack oriented. And so they want to have programmers who can navigate that whole stack because they're organized in a different way. One thing I found really interesting was that there was a research paper in the Association for Information Systems Journal called Toward a Consistent Definition of Full Stack Development. One thing they found interesting here was their final definition. So they talked a little bit about different stacks, databases, programming languages, what's running where. And their consensus, I'd like to just read it, is full stack development is a methodology which addresses all stack layers and in doing so creates a complete implementable solution to business requirements. Full stack developers have broad experience among all stack layers and expertise in a few layers. So they should be able to render a minimum viable product in a given stack. So I think a few key things here are broad experience across all layers and expertise in a few and render a minimum viable product in a given stack. So I'll, of course, I'll put links to that below. Now, how do you become a full stack developer, right? So of course, one is just learning each part of the stack. Two, I think working at startups tends to give you a much better chance of staying and doing full stack development than working at big companies. And nothing against big companies, it's just that big companies tend to, um, even though they're trying to kind of organize in small teams, they tend to just have more specialists, right? So they tend to care more about your expertise in one part of the program than in you know, the whole kind of stack of the program, right? And so the startups just tend to give you more autonomy, chance to work on various parts. So for example, I'll give you, you know, stories I hear from my friends at, uh, students at Google is that, you know, they end up working on a very specific thing using very specific tools that are Google specific. And so when they come out of Google, it's, you know, everyone loves to hire Google engineers, don't get me wrong, but when they come out of Google, they almost have to relearn kind of how developments handle outside the world because it's just, it's just done very differently in Google, right? And so, you know, you can't just, hey, I'm going to uh, add a field to a database and then pull it and then run this logic on it because the database of Google is so complex, so scalable that, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's a whole different process for just, you know, throwing a field in there, for example. One other thing I love, and I'm going to make a video about this, is work and deploy side projects, right? And so side projects are, or the way I think of this is that your company probably doesn't, needs you to do what it needs you to do, right? So your company's not necessarily going to think, we want to keep you as a full stack programmer. And so you have to really own that yourself, right? And so working on side projects is something that really gives you a chance to work on each part of the stack and understand how these pieces fit together and why these pieces are important. So just from my own experience, I built something um, probably almost 10 years ago. It's a patient appointment reminder service. And I built the entire thing in Ruby on Rails. And I'm a single man shop. I run it. I make sure that the database stays up and running. I tune the databases. I tune the Rails app. I wrote the front end. And so it really gives me a chance that really, and whenever I want to learn a new skill, I'll take a part of my app and update it, right? And so I have added Node.js components to it. I've added Java components to it. I've added React components to the front end. And it's a chance for me to always work on real things, but not tied to a business need, right? And not tied to what my current company needs. And then one last thing is to be T-shaped, right? So this goes back to that research paper of broad at many skill expertise as a few. So T-shaped is, it comes from this, well, at least it was made popular by this Valve, um, the game company. They had a handbook that says, we value T-shaped people, which means broad in many things and deep in a few, right? So broad range generalist, deep in a few. And if you look at here, this is a great article I thought on what it means to be a T-shaped person, right? That you understand where all these pieces fit, but you are expertise in one, right? And so the really, you know, you pick where I always tell students, 
and people who are early in their code learning journey don't optimize too early, right? Be broad and then go deep where you find your interest. And you're, you'll be very naturally guided toward those interests based off of your own, you know, where you find yourself wanting to spend time and, and dedicate and dedicate energy to is what I would say, that's where you should go deep. So one final point, you know, at full stack, we teach JavaScript programming because JavaScript is really unique in the fact that it can live at all parts of the stack, right? So of course, in the front end, in your browser, you have to use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. There's no there's no options really around it. That could change in a couple of years with the introduction of WebAssembly, but I'm not super optimistic that'll be, that'll be fast. Two is that it's, you know, each part of these things, as, as I said, they have their own culture, their own technologies, their own ecosystems. And so to have one unifying language that you can take into all these different ecosystems is nice, right? So people in React, your skills in JavaScript transfer to the React community. Your skills in JavaScript transfer to the Re Node community. Your skills in JavaScript transfer even to the the MongoDB community. Postgres is even adding support for things like JSON storage and um, JavaScript as a as a scriptable language you can use in Postgres. And and so I think if you want to be a full stack developer and you're starting out in your journey, JavaScript is just it's just the easiest way to go, right? Don't pick, you know. I'm going to do Java on the back end, JavaScript on the front end. That's just two things to learn at the same time. And finally, I want to talk about other full stack skills. So when I think about you know a full stack unicorn, uh, what is someone who I would love to be the number one or number two person in a startup, right? So not only do they have the skills to work across the entire ecosystem of technology, but they have a good sense of product management, good sense of dev processes, right? Like agile, how to use Git, how to gather requirements. They have some DevOps skills, right? So they understand, you know, how to scale up in Amazon, maybe how to scale up in, in Google Cloud. Um, they understand kind of what it means to have repeatable environments. Uh, they understand a little bit about scalability. They have some design and UI UX skills. I think this is critical too, right? If you, you how, can, how much can you really work on the front end if you have no design skills? And two, mobile, right? Understand things like what it what are the trade-offs between building something in Objective C versus Java on Android versus doing native or mobile web versus doing something like React Native, right? So understanding those trade-offs and kind of where they sit relative to what your business need is. And finally, a lot of articles that talk about full-site development really capture this idea of empathy, right? What does it mean to really care and understand the challenges that each other each other person in your team is having is the best way to kind of become a full-site developer, right? To really listen and key in on Here's the things that this part of the stack or this this person in our technology organization is their value they bring to our development, our business needs. And so having that listening ear is another big part of being a full stack developer. All right, I hope that was helpful and to understand kind of what it means to be a full stack developer, why it's important, what are the pros, cons, and what are the things that you want to develop and train for to, if you want yourself to become a full stack developer. Now, if you like content like this, subscribe to our channel. We are working on creating content on for beginning programmers on how to think about the world of programming and your journey, your road to code into it. So you see some other videos working on tutorial purgatory, something we hear a lot and what kind of people get into jobs like Google. So those are coming up, subscribe for notifications and we'll talk to you soon.